Matthew Barron, Executive Editor of the Washington Post, gracias por estar aquí. Gracias por invitarme. It's a pleasure to, to have you. It's a pleasure to be in this new Washington Post. We'll talk about that in a, in a second. But uh, first of all, I want to say something. I don't know if Marty Baron is the best newspaper editor in the world, as it was uh, actually written somewhere. Uh, but what I am sure is that you are the hottest, because you are going to go to the Oscars, right? I am going to the Oscars, absolutely. Did you receive the invitation? We have received the invitation. I don't have the tickets in hand yet, but okay. I'm going. Great. Uh, I, want, I want to see some selfies out there. Uh, <laughs> with hot stars, by the way. Okay, uh, this uh, joke comes because of a Spotlight. Spotlight is uh, the movie about uh, how a team at the Boston Globe investigated the Catholic Church sexual scandals, uh, you ended up receiving uh, a Pulitzer Prize for the investigation. It got huge repercussions. Um, Marty, can you summarize for me, for us, the lessons of the Spotlight? Well, I think the lesson of Spotlight is that we need to hold our powerful institutions and our powerful individuals accountable. Uh, that's what we did in Boston. Here you had the church uh, that had engaged in a cover-up lasting decades in which it allowed uh, priests who had abused children to remain in ministry. Uh, they sent them to different parishes without any notification to the parishioners. And so uh, it was important that the newspaper in town in Boston uh, hold that institution accountable for what it had done and mm -hmm. find out who was responsible. The issue also that transpires in the movie, and I think somehow in, in some conversations between you and I, is that it's not only about the institution that you investigate, but it's also about the institution that investigates. It's about media sometimes being complacent because the environment. And here you are, um, I'm going to say it, the Jewish boy coming to town. Um, sometimes it takes an outsider to see things. Uh, well, I think it does sometimes. Uh, the people in Boston had covered uh, the, the issue of abuse years earlier in the late in the early 1990s mm -hmm. uh, in a case in Fall River, Massachusetts, there was a priest who had abused children. Uh, but they had done that very intensively at the time. They were subject to a lot of criticism from the church. Uh, but then, then they had largely stopped that coverage. They had regular coverage, but not investigative coverage. And so when I came in, I saw that there was a story that needed more work. Uh, one of the questions was, how do we get at the truth? You had the uh, lawyer for the victims, the survivors, mm -hmm. saying that the cardinal himself knew about this abuse and yet allowed this priest to stay in ministry. And you had the lawyers for the church saying that those were baseless charges, irresponsible charges. And the question was, how do we find out what the truth is? You have one side saying one thing and another side saying something else. And the newspaper at the time had not done everything possible to get at the truth because there were documents, internal church documents, that were under seal in the court. Mm -hmm. And the question that I raised at the time is, have we thought of the possibility of bringing a motion to unseal those documents? And that's something that the, the Boston Globe, the newspaper there, had, had not done until that point. Mm -hmm. um, how did you feel looking at yourself incarnated by somebody else in a movie theater? Uh, well, it's very strange. Um, and of course, I didn't go into journalism in order to be portrayed in a, in a movie. I had no expectation that that would happen. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had no expectation that this movie would ever be made. I thought it would not be made, as a matter of fact. Uh, but I'm gratified that the, the movie was made. I think it sends an important message to the public, however skeptical it may be, about the role of the press. Mm -hmm. uh, it acknowledges that we're flawed, but it also makes the point that it, the press is necessary in terms of holding powerful institutions and individuals accountable. Mm -hmm. I, I remember seeing somewhere you saying that seeing yourself portrayed in a movie was like an out-of-body experience or something like that. <laughs> I, can, I can relate to that. I can see that. Um, just a recommendation uh, for journalists out there. Uh, what, uh, Marty Baron, what uh, an editor in, in big media like the Washington Post is looking at when you look at new journalists coming to the profession? Uh, we look for people who have all the basic skills. They have intellectual curios curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, they know how to report. They know how to write. Uh, they believe in the principles of being honest, honorable, fair, but also energetic in their coverage and unflinching in their coverage as well, that they'll tell the truth as they find it. 
So we look for all of that, but we also look for people who really understand all of the new tools that we have available to, to us today. Uh, they understand new storytelling forms, they understand social media, uh, they understand video, they understand audio, and they can bring all of that to bear in their journalism every day. Here at the Washington Post, in the new, the new uh, headquarters, uh, great space, I, I am enjoying it, I don't know, I suppose you are enjoying yes, it. Yes, absolutely. Um, because you are part of this transition of the Washington Post, this historical moment also. Um, so it seems that you have this ability of being in the right place at the right time. I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> uh, but um, there are these walls that are blue with great quotes from the greatest in, in the journalism uh, business. Uh, you have Ben Bradley saying great thing about truths and, uh, truth and lies. You have the Grams, obviously. But there is one by the owner of uh, the Washington Post, Jeff Bezos, who says that the only danger is not to evolve. So are we in this industry living a revolution, an evolution? What's going on with the industry? I think right now we're living a revolution in the industry. Uh, I think it's important to remember that some of the most important developments in the world of media mm -hmm. uh, only came into existence in the last 15 years. Uh, the iPhone, uh, the uh, Facebook, Google News, things like that. These haven't been around very long. Uh, people forget about that. So mm -hmm. all of this has happened uh, quite rapidly and all of us in media have had to adjust to that and we're still trying to adjust to it, struggling to as a matter of fact. And it's had a tremendous impact on our finances, it's also had a tremendous impact on the way we report and it's had a tremendous impact on the way people get information and news. And so uh, we do have to evolve. In fact, it's, I'm not sure evolution is the right word for it. We have to move more quickly than that and because things are going to get out ahead of us. And so we have to use all the new tools that are available to us. We have to understand that uh, digital platforms represent an entirely new medium for us. And so storytelling is going to change dramatically and mm -hmm. already is. Mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's use some of, of these tools, like for example, the Spanish language skills. Uh, the New York Times is bringing Spanish language into their uh, internet environment. The Washington Post has been doing it with El Tiempo Latino since the purchase in 2004. Um, ¿Cómo ves, cómo ve Marty Baron la utilización del idioma español dentro de estas grandes marcas de prensa? Y tal vez se intentan construir nuevas audiencias. ¿Cómo, cómo ves el fenómeno? Bueno, hay que reconocer que hay una gran, un gran porcentaje de la población que es hispano y está creciendo mucho. Y tenemos que, que uh, adaptar, adaptarnos a, a ese mercado. Pero todavía no hemos descubierto la manera de, de, de obtener una, un, 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 una, gran, un, una gran audiencia de lectores hispanos. Y deberíamos seguir tratando de obtener esa, esa audiencia. Cuando Jeff Bezos estuvo aquí, le pregunté sobre el concepto del español, te miró a ti, dijo que estaban pensando, estaban viendo qué estrategias. Um, me quedé intrigado, sobre todo por el hecho de que hice el chiste inevitable, como su padre es cubano, técnicamente el Washington Post es un periódico <risa> propiedad de hispano. Um, pero en, en cualquier caso, sí sé, um, uh, and, and our audience just uh, noticed that you speak Spanish, that Spanish is inside the Washington Post already. Um, and um, I don't want to finish this conversation, Mari, uh, without asking you about Jason. Uh, when, we, when you open uh, officially the, these uh, headquarters, uh, you had dignitaries, you had uh, uh, Secretary Kerry here, um, and you had Jason Resayan, the Washington Post reporter that spent over 500 days in a jail in Iran. Uh, first question, how is Jason? Um, how went the whole crisis uh, um, and, and the involvement of uh, your personal involvement and Jeff Bezos' involvement? Right. Well, I think that Jason is doing fine physically. Uh, when you consider that he was in prison for 545 days and 49 days in solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, but I think the fact of sort of being in prison for that long period of time obviously has to have an impact on someone. Uh, for such a long period of time, he didn't have normal human contact. Uh, he seems fine. He's, he's conversational. He seems in good spirits. Obviously, he's uh, relieved uh, and delighted to be a free man yet again. To be he, was, he was very emotional here when he was here, thanking yeah. everybody. He was. Because they, they, uh, according to him, he was told that nobody was paying attention. Right. So it was really in, in And I think it's important to remember that when he was in prison, he had no idea when he might get out of prison mm -hmm. or whether he would get out of prison, that he could be there for the rest of his life for 10 years or 20 years or something like that. The charges against him were very serious. They were unproven. The, the, the Iranian government, government never provided any evidence that he did anything wrong publicly at all that we could see. And so uh, he's an innocent man. Uh, and, and so we're relieved that he's been released. But it's going to take him some time to adjust to, I think, to his freedom. He has a lot of decisions to make about what he wants to do with his life and his career. And I think right now he's in the process of taking his time to make those sorts of decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to just say thank you and goodbye to you. But before I have the last question, that is not a question, it's almost a, a commentary. Is it true that the Washington Post is going to take over the whole media industry? <laughs> I think, that's un I think that's unlikely, but we are growing very fast, and we're pleased by that. So we have about 76 million unique visitors per month as of the month of December, and I think that January will be higher than that when the numbers come in. Uh, so we're very pleased at our, our rate of growth, and uh, we passed the New York Times in the, month of, in the month of October in terms of the number of visitors to our digital platforms in the United States uh, by U.S. people coming to our digital platforms. And so we're very pleased with our rate of growth and we intend to keep growing and uh, we'll see where that takes us. Martí Barrio, a pleasure. Muchas gracias. Gracias a ti.